Hello everybody, welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. Today's episode features Flovtech, an award-winning leader in the field of liquidity provision for digital assets. As a key player in the blockchain ecosystem, Flovtech fosters price stability and reduces transaction costs, for the benefit of all market participants. The firm is built on three pillars, a highly experienced and visionary team, tested investment strategies and a professional operational structure. The team is comprised of blockchain pioneers with detailed insights into the ecosystem of digital assets and its future, experienced asset management professionals with proven track records and quants that can deploy investment strategies in a quick and efficient manner. And now, please welcome Anton Golub, founder and chief executive officer of Flovtech. Hi, Anton. Welcome to the show. Great to see you again. Likewise, it's a pleasure to be a part of the show. And thanks very much for the invitation and looking forward to an exciting and illuminating discussion. So hopefully I will spill out some secrets as well, you know, in this discussion. So we met about a year ago in Seoul, actually. Don't remember what the price of Bitcoin was at the time, but it's clearly nicer to have the conversation being closer to 14,000 than eight or nine or so. So you, you must be happy because it drives attention to the market again. Yes, I'm extremely happy. And I think it's very interesting what you emphasize now is that it turns out that the price is such a magnet for talented, smart people who want to get engaged that we are actually all benefiting quite a lot because of the price, which is quite counterintuitive because you would think, well, the groundwork, the heavy lifting has to be done no matter what the price is. So I kind of have to say like at one side, I'm very happy because the price attracts new people to enter the digital asset industry. On the other side, old timers and dinosaurs like me are happy because we are suffering less than before, but we were keen on continuing no matter what the price is because we're passionate about the big opportunity the digital asset is bringing to us and we're passionate about changing the financial industry for the better of everyone. And so you've been very early in the crypto space, of course. You've been one of the co-founders of Lucky. Now you're on your second venture at the very least. Yeah. And there's probably a few more that you can talk about. Love technology, your motto is stay liquid. So you're a liquidity provider in the broadest sense. What yeah. does it mean? I'm happy to explain what Flovtech does. And I, if you don't mind, I will just briefly reflect on my experience so far so we can get light bulb moment where I had when I realized that liquidity might be important. So to make it very short, my background is actually I was a high frequency trader, a market maker in the foreign exchange markets. And I was then fortunate to be at the right time at the right place. And in 2013, founded one of the first blockchain companies in Switzerland called Lickem, where we built a digital asset exchange where people could trade cryptocurrencies, but also, for instance, digital currencies like euros, dollars, yen, Swiss francs, and so on. And they could also trade some exotic assets like carbon credits and royalties and so on. So this was our big vision because we saw the potential of tokenization and actually trading digital assets. And we did something very unique early on. As far as I know, we issued the world's first security token. So it means we digitized our own shares, put them on the blockchain to something called the colored coin protocol that nobody remembers today uh, on the blockchain of Bitcoin. And then listed on our exchange and they were tradable. And then when you run an exchange, but especially when you issue your own token, when that are shares of your company, you realize firsthand how painful it is when you don't have liquidity at your own digital asset exchange, especially for your own shares. So I kind of saw that firsthand and I took that very positive. I said, okay, this is a big challenge. We have a problem, but let's find a solution. And I kind of went around and said, we're a Swiss company. We really wanted to do things the right way. So I said, I said, let me find a market maker who will do this in a stable, robust way and be regulated to comply. Let's find that solution provider. And I went around and I was like, there is no players like that, that we could partner up with because we realized that the liquidity is very important. And we were kind of just had this ongoing problem and we couldn't find the right fit. And then I took this whole big challenge very positively and said, why don't I try to solve this problem? Because actually every exchange and every token issued ever will actually have the same need, same need for liquidity. And then I left Lika in January 2018 and then in May founded Flovtech. And what we are, we're a Swiss technology company and we offer market making solutions to digital asset exchanges and to token issues with the goal of creating a liquid and efficient market. So this is kind of my whole story and evolution, how I ended up here where I am now. 
liquidity is one of these terms that is often misused or abused and many people use it in the context of tokenization itself tokenizing an asset it means it's tradable but it doesn't mean you have a liquid market you don't necessarily have market depth and so ultimately yeah. you come in then with bid and offers and create the market depth and the ability to execute actually with that token Exactly. And first, it's very important to mention, I personally think that liquidity is the missing piece in the digital asset ecosystem to really make it flourish. And as you mentioned, liquidity is just the ability to easily buy and sell an asset. And people are quite aware in the digital asset ecosystem this is extremely important. I ask people, why do you think liquidity is important? They would tell me, yes, because liquid assets are less risky and more attractive. It's like straightforward answer. And you get the point that is very, very intuitive for people. And a company that provides market making solution just provides those buy and sell prices. And I do have to say, I try to reflect a bit how liquidity is perceived. If I call the crypto wild west, for me, it's actually very interesting how well aware the people are of the need of liquidity, even if they're retail investors. So I was fascinated to see small investors who talk about how the token has to be liquid. Because if you walk on the street and you ask a random person, what's liquidity? They would look at you. Is it like I drink something and I'm like hydrated? Is it that or is it something else? So it's very fascinating to see that. On the security token side, it's a must. Because people who are in the world, in the security token world, they are come from finance background. And the first question that they ask, they say, okay, you want to tokenize an asset, that's great, but so what? I can trade fractions then, but so what? It doesn't really create liquidity. And they are aware that there has to be a service. There's a need for liquidity, and then they're looking for partners that would solve that problem. If I now zoom out from all of this, my big dream one day is that liquidity is a household word. You know, in 10, 20 years, your grandchildren come to you and say, hey, you know, I have issued a token. And the first question that the family asks is, oh, but is it liquid? So that's how I imagine it. And hopefully if Floftech is there around and doing things the right way, then maybe you will tell them, oh, you need to Floftech it or flow it because that's how liquidity is created. But zooming out, big picture is that my dream is that one day uh, we use the blockchain, it really provides added value and liquidity is a household world that everybody knows, not just finance experts. And so you mentioned essentially two target groups. One is the token issuers and the other is the exchanges. How does this split for you in terms of the activity? And how does this work for an exchange? Do you support liquidity across a whole exchange or for specific tokens? And then reverse on the issuer side, do you create a liquidity for them on all the exchanges that they are listed or also individual mandate? If I reflect on the two target groups, it turns out that usually we get approached by exchanges because they're the ones who actually have a bit more experience and understand if we launch our exchange, not having liquidity from day one is a big problem. And they understand that you cannot resolve the problem of liquidity by onboarding just users. Because people think if there's no users, there's no liquidity, but if there's no users, there's no liquidity. So somehow something doesn't fit here. So they understand, let's break this vicious cycle with a liquidity provider, with a market making solution. And actually it's very common that exchanges approach us directly. To make a point, what we see is actually that at the moment we have actually more exchanges actually that are being launched than actually necessarily that the tokens are being created, which is a bit counterintuitive. I get puzzled. Why is that the case? Because I always hear the story, there will be a consolidation of exchanges. And I have seen two bull runs in my digital asset career, the one in 2014 and 2017. And I always people tell me there'll be less exchanges. So I think it's natural that exchanges contacts are first. And the way they want to do it actually is that they, at the beginning, when exchanges launch, they want to focus on the most attractive digital assets, which are cryptocurrencies, which is your usual suspects like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, and things like that. And then they kind of approach us, say, can your market making solution actually resolve the problem of real liquidity in this particular cryptocurrencies from day one when they launch? And this is actually very common now, what how we are approached. This is how exchanges see this problematic very clear. Now, if you move to token issuers, the token issuers are very specific how they interact with us. They just come to us and say, I heard from an exchange that my token has to be liquid. I don't know why I need you or what is it so big deal? Everybody tells me liquidity is important, but the exchange tells me I cannot list without a market making solution. So it seems like the exchanges do a lot of education with the token issues where they really tell them, look, if there is no liquidity from day one, like nobody's happy. If I have to say it in terms of uh, the business opportunities, exchanges are multipliers in that context because they're the ones who literally demand a market-making solution for the token issue. And this is actually basically how it works. 
What I see is that there's a lot of awareness about liquidity. And one other item is that Uniswap and automated market making protocols really raised even further awareness about market making solutions. And I was told by a very good friend out of Asia, out of Hong Kong, he told me, Anton, you're golden now. Just mention market making liquidity and it's part of the biggest hype now because that's where the action is happening. That's a good point, actually, because people talk about AMM, automated market making, in the context of Uniswap, Curve, Balancer, and so on. And so to draw the differentiation, these AMM protocols are based on smart contracts and yes. curves that are built in. And exactly. you're running the classic technology that you described yes. also when you said you were trading FX as a high-frequency trader. So you're essentially applying traditional capital markets, high-frequency trading trading technologies yes. to the new crypto markets. Exactly. And I really want to point out that these are two segregated methods of providing liquidity and those free spirit decentralized way of doing things in a very simple way, but it works, is actually two automated market making protocols, which are quite simplistic. They are great prototypes. They show that really they work and that it can be a use case for a service out of the box for upcoming projects that are specifically focused on DeFi because this is where we see DeFi projects are attractive for automated market making protocols but non-DeFi projects don't live up to the hype and kind of on the other side we really have professional operations that do this more on an institutional level where they really focus on many different aspects of creating a stable and robust infrastructure that could satisfy the need of the end client just wanted to reflect on something because I got asked the other day a very challenging question by a person. He said, have we ever seen before automated market making protocols like in a different form? And I was doing my research and it turns out we have. In the early 90s, the US equity market implemented something called small order execution system, which mandated that the market makers had to quote prices at predetermined levels for certain stocks. And if you think about it, wow, that's very similar like automated market making protocols, because that's actually what happens in the automated market making setup. Then the question asked me in a follow-up said, but was the so-called SEOS system, was it a huge success story? And I said, no, when you read about it, it was not. Because automated market making protocols, the small order execution system was easily arbitraged because they quote all the time at predetermined levels. So if you get how the gimmick works, you can actually arbitrage it. It turns out out of these SOES systems, a famous group of participants came out called SOES bandits because they made so much money arbitraging the systems. They said they're making money like bandits on this SOES system. So I think we have to be proud that we have innovative solutions like automated market making product, but we should always go and read in the history books if somebody did similar before and then try to learn from that so we don't repeat the same mistakes. Absolutely. Now, since we are on the history topic, I've been looking back at your biography a bit. And one thing that stuck out was you were participating in the math Olympics at one point when you were in high school, I suppose. But then also you were a researcher and you did some work for the FSA at that time in London, projecting what the electronic trading environment in the markets will look like in the future. So if you look back on that study, how do you think that has evolved? Has it evolved as you predicted at the time or what's the different outcome? Just to provide the context, we actually did a study for Her Majesty's Treasury. So it's the equivalent of UK Treasury. And it was actually one of the biggest projects ever called the Future of Financial Markets. Basically, they hired a lot of people to do research on different topics. So we all kind of got different topics and I was hired as well. I think they were not aware how young I was when they hired me because I remember when they met me, they would talk to me and the end they would say, wow, you're really young. I have to provide the context why this study came about is because two years before we had the flash crash in May 2010, where really the whole equity markets collapsed out of nowhere within a couple of minutes. And even the regulator and the governmental bodies had awareness that something needs to be changed. And there's this new breed of traders, high frequency traders that might be actually running the whole markets behind the scene. First, I have to point out is that when we were doing the studies, blockchain was nowhere and digital assets were nowhere. Now I was reflecting as you were saying it, I think not a single person or report actually mentioned digital assets on the blockchain at that time, which was this 2011, 2012. And just, it was completely different focus. The message of that study, in my humble opinion, was that you can actually impact the financial markets a lot with rules and regulations. 
And those regulations and rules can be very well intentioned, but they can always have side effects or consequences that only came about later when we see actually the result out of it. A lot of the discussion in this particular reports on computerized trading was how to actually put regulation and rules in place that prevent further massive market crashes. But then to reflect on it, do we actually actually introduce other risks that we might not be aware at that moment? Because during those periods, the regulators and the governments were really hands-on. They would say, we need to solve it, we need to change it, and let's do it now. But we need to be cautious. So going back now to digital assets, I think we're at the same tipping point. The regulators, everybody's aware we have to do things the proper way. The crypto wild west is slowly going away. We have to do things now in a proper way. But we have a unique opportunity to do it either the wrong way or the right way. If we do it the right way, there will be a lot of rules that are not fit for the new markets and the new digital asset world. And we have to be cautious that we first reduce the risks as much as possible, but also enable innovation. That was an exciting diversion for me because it's my old world, obviously, as well. And as you mentioned the flash crash, it took them 18 months or so to figure out and piece it together what actually happened. And the result of that was obviously the new regulation, which is called the Consolidated Audit Trail. Or exactly. Head, and, and people have been implementing that now forever. But let's go back for the audience to crypto. You mentioned the mushrooming of the exchanges and clearly many of them by now, as you said, we get a more regulated environment and less of a wild west. Many of these new exchanges are regulated or will be regulated. Jurisdictions like Singapore that have come up, but there's still enough of them that are a little more in the wild west and unregulated. And it feels like the whole ecosystem is breaking into these two segments of being fully compliant and being yeah. out there and almost like a dark net. So do you care from your perspective who your client is and under which jurisdiction they fall? Yeah, just want to say you're absolutely right with your assessment that things are moving more towards the regulated way or the regulated manner. And I think that's very positive for the industry because the big investors, the big tickets, you know, the big players, they want to see things done properly. And also there is a penalty if actually something goes wrong. That's very important in my discussions with a lot of institutional investors. I have to say on Floftech side, it's very much important for that. And we actually do a very strict due diligence on exchanges because we are compliant and regulated in Switzerland. It means that once a year, an auditor comes into your company and says, let me see everything. And then you actually have to demonstrate that you actually have policies that mitigate risks, that you're doing things the right way. And if then they're happy, then you actually conduct your normal business. Yeah. So for us, it's therefore very important to demonstrate competence and that we actually conduct due diligence on the exchanges. We have a very thorough due diligence questionnaire for exchanges. And I really had situations where some of the world's largest exchanges, when we would have a call with them, we would go through the questionnaire and in the middle of it, they would stop and say, nobody has ever asked this before. You're so thorough. What is happening here? And I said, well, that's, those are the standards if you want to actually work with institutional players. You know, This is actually what I can definitely say that still the industry in that sense is very much immature, but it's getting more mature. We literally had situations where exchanges in particular, want to work with us because we're a compliant and regulated entity out of Switzerland. They clearly tell us the offshore entities, you know, in the gray zone, this doesn't work anymore. I'm not saying that every digital asset exchange has communicated to us, but already few have. This is an early trend. Also, maybe this is my personal opinion. I wondered why are they now changing their processes and their opinions? You know, why is it that they kind of are going really in that direction? And then it turns out there's a very simple reason is when exchanges raise a lot of funding from institutional investors, their institutional investors tell them, now you need to step up your compliance game. So it's a very different, weird dynamics that actually institutional investors who invest into players who want to be professional are then actually required to step up their game, which then spills over to all the other ecosystem that everybody else needs to. So it turns out that maybe we're just motivated by institutional investors who provide fresh capital to build up this great digital asset ecosystem. And they maybe are, maybe this is anecdotal NFS, but maybe they will be the driver of why things become a lot more professional. You're also regulated as an investment manager in Switzerland, is that correct? Since even before we started running our algorithms, we actually are a member of Swiss Association of Asset Managers. And literally that means is actually they police us so that we, you know, as I mentioned, this process actually that you have to do things the right way. And, you know, we are proud that we are actually uh, abiding to those standards. And it's becoming more and more actually a very unique feature of the Floftech that we proudly mentioned. We probably, probably mentioned it before, but actually today it's very well accepted. 
So people are actually happy when we tell them that we actually comply with the highest Swiss regulatory standards and that we will do that going forward. So are you actually in the market making side when we're talking about liquid assets, really like, like a Bitcoin or Ethereum, you don't necessarily need to carry a risk on your books, but are you otherwise putting your own capital at risk when it's the yeah. more liquid tokens? So this is a peculiar setup actually on our side that as we operate as an asset manager in many of these setups, actually, we don't take risk on our balance sheet. So we actually, it's a usually what we run our managed accounts, if you can recall the terminology from the financial markets, where actually the end client is always in full control of the account, which is great for him because he reduces any counterparty risk and he's on control. And formally, we just get trading rights through a power of attorney, which power of attorney is just a document that actually specifies that we can do certain items when it revolves around that account. And it's also, it's very efficient setup and also it reduces a lot of risks for all the counterparties in this matter. And also it fits our narrative and our vision and our values of doing things, everything in a fully automated way and computerized way. Hence, from a practical perspective, I will say a bit of a tech language. We just need the so-called API keys that give us access to the application programming interface and then the whole infrastructure on our side runs. If it's a token issuer, you basically run the treasury for that. Exactly. Exactly. So we manage a small part of the corporate treasury for the purpose of actually delivering the liquidity goals. And to explain like how these liquidity goals work, they revolve around uptime. So it means kind of that you are constantly quoting in the market a spread. Of course, the tighter the spread, you know, the more liquid asset and like what the depth at which levels, how many levels, and how tight are those levels and what are the sizes at which we quote. And of course, everything fully automated, computerized, agreed together with the client. And also a client can then provide an input if they say, I want more liquidity. You have the basic uh, liquidity, then the liquidity plus and different ways how much liquidity you can provide. Clients can choose that. And likewise, we also proactively approach clients if we notice that the market activity is such that it demands more liquidity or less liquidity, we proactively approach a client to tell them, look, actually there's a need for more liquidity for your particular token. How about we actually increase the liquidity goals? And then it's up to the client to decide. So given your setup, do you offer like a quant trading product? Do you have a quant fund where people can yeah. give you the money and say like, you just have your algos run on my money? Yes. In addition to the market making solutions, we also offer investment products. So actually we were approached by a couple of family offices and professional investors in Switzerland who said, well, you have this amazing infrastructure, low latency trading system, connectivity algorithms. How about actually we give you capital and that you can actually manage that capital with your algorithms, but with a pure goal of generating performance. There's a set of algorithms that actually satisfy the liquidity goals, but then you can actually say those algorithms drop the liquidity goals and just are concerned with generating performance like any other quantitative investment strategies. And just recently, we have launched an investment product, which is an actively managed certificate, quite typical setup in Europe and in Asia, not so much in the US where we don't target the investors either way. And uh, I'm very happy actually to say that we, you know, uh, we managed to, within a short uh, time period, raise uh, 1.5 million. And that's actually deployed on some of the world's largest digital asset exchanges where we run our algorithms and generate nice performance for our uh, professional institution investors. So I can buy this certificate on the Zurich exchange or, or so? Actually, we wanted to make it super simple for the end investors. Our product has something called an ISIN, which is International Securities Identification Number. And you just type this ISIN in an app or a wealth management app or with a broker. You tell your bank and you just say the amount and you click the button and it's invested into our product. Quite straightforward and simple, actually. Your team size on the web page is relatively small. So if, if you take out the co-founders, you have a quant team and a tech team of six people, three quants and three IT software engineers, which is a pretty efficient operation. First, what I wanted to say is actually that our technology, our infrastructure and algorithms are actually built on decades of experience. And if you kind of look at the CVs of those people who we, a very great team that I'm proud to have, you have big names there mentioned in the resumes, like some of the world's largest banks, some of the world's largest market makers in the traditional world, and also some of the bigger names as well from the digital asset world. Really what my experience is that building a high performance market making infrastructure actually requires really specific skill set that you cannot actually resolve with younger, unexperienced people. And also, so we were very focused, we said, let's just get the best people, a small team, but that has a lot of experience with this and they can build a robust, stable, safe and secure market making solution that just performs exactly as it's expected by the end client. What we also learned, this was from my experience also before from Lika, that 
many times building a sophisticated infrastructure is kind of like doing a surgery. You can have two surgeons who actually do the surgery, but if you put 10 of them in the room, the eight of them will still not do anything. They will sit on the side and say, well, it's just the two men. If you have highly skilled surgeons, two of them actually do all the work. We should be very strategic about resources, especially when it comes to high performance infrastructures. And we therefore chose people with a lot of experience, with a lot of insights, but then be very selective about that. Team. I hope it makes sense. It absolutely makes sense. And it's also just another indication that it is something that's been proven in the traditional markets for a long time. You're now applying it to a new asset class that is expanding rapidly and you're hopefully riding that wave, but you're not reinventing how trading works. Exactly. I mean, this is really decades of experience that we're bringing to the table. I do want to point out, I mean, some digital assets are quite unique in their features, but I think if we're talking about the constant here, no matter it's a traditional financial system or the new digital asset world, you need to build a safe, robust, scalable, high performance uh, infrastructure in the core. The core has to be stable. And that was our mission from the first day. And so in the traditional markets, it has moved from the functions and how you trade also to a large component of speed. Have you seen that emerging in the crypto markets or security markets already as well? If I talk about the crypto world, actually, we have seen this emerging and it usually manifests itself with exchanges offering co-location services. So this is kind of like the first step saying, how can we actually enable the fastest traders to actually be fast? And there's a couple of exchanges actually that offer these co-location services. Many times, unlike in the traditional markets, they're hybrid. And I'll explain why. And they're hybrid in a sense that exchanges run their infrastructure in an Amazon data center. And then they actually tell you which Amazon data center it is actually. And then you can co-locate pretty much, I'm paraphrasing here, but in the same room. So this is actually how a lot of exchanges are actually doing it, but also certain exchanges as well are actually using traditional service providers there. I think like Equinox is there, you know, and they kind of just deploy their service there and then you can co-locate as well. So can we see this is actually emerging, but I do want to point out here that our now extensive experience with a lot of these exchanges, they're not built actually as professional trading venues. And we see it actually both from the APIs that use, both from how matching engines are designed. And I can give you a clear example here. A lot of exchanges use so-called REST APIs. REST APIs are in the tech world used if you have a website that needs to stream some data. And obviously when you're talking about financial markets, you would never use actually something like that. You would use something that's high performance, that's extremely fast, which are either direct data feeds or fixed protocol, but definitely not REST APIs. So we kind of see that these legacy issues from a lot of these big exchanges are still present because they started very early on. And very early on, a slow API was a fine. But as we're getting maturing, that will have to change. The exchanges will change or they will not survive. So rather than consolidation, it's maybe a maturing of the market that you described where some of them can keep pace and keep investing and upgrading the infrastructure with the market demands and some others will just see decreasing volumes and ultimately die. Yeah. The other question, in the overall market structure, are there still arbitrage opportunities between exchanges or has that disappeared because all the markets are relatively liquid? What we see actually that if you look at the top tier exchanges, the arbitrage opportunities are less present, but very much dependent on volatility. So that when the markets go berserk, then those arbitrage opportunities appear, you can capture them as kind of things get more calmed down. I don't think they're a good foundation for a business model of the future. So let's say it like that. But there's still a lot of other exchanges out there that actually that are slower, that you know don't have the infrastructure at the right level. And this is where the opportunities arise. So if I have to kind of describe it, you kind of have to go to the tail end of the distribution in terms of quality of exchanges to find those arbitrage opportunities, which is great because you can capture them, but which is not great because you have huge counterparty risk. Because these are exchanges that can literally, you know, the website is gone the next day and then you really want to wonder uh, where are your funds sitting. People are aware of it. Hence, you have service providers now that try to address these problems. And I'm sure you have heard about Coiny, Copper, Fireblocks that try to offer this off-exchange custody and settlement solution. And I think actually what I just described, that's going to be the future. You're not going to hold assets on an exchange because this is just 
not how it works. And if you tell to a person a traditional financial market that your assets are on an exchange, they would even tell you, what do you mean? An exchange is a matching engine. It holds no assets, you know? So I think we need to do that maturity and that maturity will, uh, will happen in, actually in the near term, in my view. The other aspect of maturity in markets is always the derivatives markets as a hatching and also income generation vehicle. And are you offering your services in the derivative space as well? So on the derivative side, we trade futures, but at the moment we're not trading options, yeah? And if I have to give you a high level overview of the derivatives markets focusing on the two buckets, what we see is actually that still perpetual futures or perpetual swaps are still quite dominant. And the quarterly, the expiring ones or the, are not so dominant, which is counterintuitive because if you come from traditional financial markets, you kind of would trade the expiring, the quarterly ones and not the other perpetual ones. And for me, it was very illuminating looking at this evolution. And I even asked people several times, why did you launch perpetual swaps? In Europe and Asian language, these are the so-called contracts for differences that doesn't exist in the US. So people who are listening, you can just imagine those are contracts for differences. And I want to ask people like, why didn't you launch expiring futures, but why did you launch perpetual futures or perpetual swaps? And they would tell me, because the clients couldn't understand the expiring futures. They would, didn't understand that you have to roll over the contract and they had trouble with it. And they just wanted something very simple that they can buy in, hold its leveraged product, and that's it. And that's actually why it ballooned is because the market was a retail driven market, which is quite you know, interesting for me. But of course, I want to say on our side, on Fortex side, we don't trade the perpetual ones, mainly for reasons because it's mostly at the exchanges where they need to step up a compliance game. And also the so-called interest fees, if you have a position with the perpetuals, you basically get charged or paid fees. And sometimes those fees can be brutal for uh, fast traders uh, or faster traders, since we are focusing on the quality ones. In terms of the options, we're not trading options, uh, but I have been closely following uh, Deribit for many years. They're actually really are quite an old player. For, they've been around for quite some time. And they're reaping the benefits of being way early because they were standing there alone for many, many years with not a lot of volume and going through the difficult process of a startup building up uh, their product and they're succeeding now. And I wish them all the best. I mean, it's amazing what they have done. Now it's been like two years with Fluff Tank, maybe a bit rocky at the beginning, simply because the market was in a crypto winter in a way. And now not only is crypto accelerating, and we talked about the price movements, but you see real movements on the security token space. It feels like maybe not quite in summer yet, but certainly it feels a bit springy. Please share some of your macro observations, the trends that you're seeing the big opportunity here that is are in the eyes of many people are actually the security tokens. That's where they really see the big, big opportunity. And this is what a lot of people are aiming for. And I can also say that Floftec has a vested interest to be a part of that big opportunity as well. What I do want to say is that security tokens always seem like they're around the corner and then you get to that corner and then you realize actually there's a bit more path to go. And that was actually my experience for the last couple of years. And I was also wondered why is it the case? And it's actually quite straightforward is that before, we didn't have regulated institutional grade players offering even the basic infrastructure for security tokens to be out there in the market. And I'm very happy actually to say that it's changing rapidly. And I can give you concrete examples. For instance, in Switzerland, we have two FINMA regulated digital asset banks, Signum and Seba. So these are native digital asset banks that deal with token, that deal with blockchain and so on. Really positive. You also have a 3S, so it's Signum Seba, but SDX or SIX, so Swiss Digital Asset Exchange, where actually they have an intention to launch a regulated exchange for a security tokens, particular digital asset. This is the ecosystem that's forming in Switzerland, quite powerful. It still takes a bit of time. And of course, Loftex seeds is all there as a, a tool with the liquidity solutions. Yeah. So just want to say definitely we're seeing a lot of progress there. And I'm very proud to mention another company, which is called Archex, which is the first ever UK regulated digital asset exchange. So they actually got the license, they're out there and talking about a bit things behind the scenes, you know, uh, very positive and uh, optimistic about their work, which will come soon. And I'm very happy to and pleased to say that Floftec actually has an official partnership with Archex because we understand each other. This is an ecosystem. 
different players bring different building blocks in this ecosystem. And of course, we are very happy actually, we have now a partner that's a regular digital asset exchange and Floftech can be that entity that provides a liquidity solution. So definitely I'm extremely optimistic, extremely happy about it, but I always remind ourselves and everybody else in this ecosystem that we need to get the first use case. We need to get the first client over the finishing line and show that it works because there is nothing more powerful to get the big players on board and to show them that it works. And that's still ongoing topic on everybody's side. And this is what I can mention as a final message around the security token. I'm reminded that always that we are all startups and actually startups, everything takes longer than expected. So of course the security tokens then take longer than expected. Also some perspective on the Crypto Valley ecosystem. Last week or the week before the CVVC top 50 report came out and Floftech, of course, was part of that again, second year in a yeah. row. Congratulations. How do you view the overall ecosystem that's been growing there in Switzerland? First, thanks for the kind words. And I want to say that I'm very proud of the Swiss Crypto Valley ecosystem in Zug. If I have to reflect and recall how it all started. So first, actually, to mention that it started all with a company called Monetas, which was actually the first ever crypto company in Switzerland. Most people don't remember it now, but they were the true pioneers and really an inspiration actually for all was when they started. Monetas was really the initial first company that started it all. And the second big event that happened was when few talented people came to Zug from the Ethereum Foundation. I mean, the foundation didn't exist at that point, and, but decided to set up the foundation in Zug in Switzerland, where actually Ethereum was born and we flourished. Yeah? And that was kind of like a second stick in the ground where we said, okay, we have something here. But this was all actually tied together. Why it became a success story is because of the passionate people at the Crypto Valley that I really want to change the world and see blockchain and digital assets and cryptocurrencies an opportunity to do that. So if you ask me what keeps the Crypto Valley community alive and growing, it's actually the people, the passionate people that you meet there that are really enthusiastic about it, that are all in, that really see the big opportunity and the big potential. And that's why it has been growing so far. I do have to say that in the 2017 period and 18 period, it was mainly driven by the ICO boom. This was not a big secret and kind of the so-called foundation model for ICOs was actually born in Switzerland and used in Switzerland where basically projects would set up a foundation, the foundation would do an ICO and then the foundation would fund the development of a protocol. Yeah. This actually game has stopped. Things are being done a bit different now. We still have foundations, but they're actually more professional, very, very professional. What we do see is actually, and that's when you ask me what's happening behind the scenes, because we are actually in this co-working spaces, in these offices. And when we see every week new companies being formed there, then you really know we're onto something and it's going to be big. That's right. You're also co-founder of the largest co-working space. It was a fascinating story in 2018. A good friend of mine and a colleague called me and he said, Anton, I have an amazing idea. Let's take a whole building in Bahnhofstrasse and fill it with digital asset companies. And it's going to be a mecca and a magnet, you know, for all these talented people to come. And so just for people to understand, Bahnhofstrasse is the main street in Zurich. You can think of it, it's like the Fifth Avenue in New York or Oxford Street in London, like the main place we managed to get a whole huge building where we actually onboarded around 300 people, 40 companies, and where they would actually do their amazing work and flourish and build their ideas. And I'm very proud that I was a co-founder of Trustware. Unfortunately, I was never too much operationally involved because I had my passion, which is Floftech. But I'm happy that I managed to contribute to the growing digital asset ecosystem in Switzerland, but also beyond because Trustware has a name today. We serve like a magnet. So when you come to this well-known so-called Parade Platz in Zurich, where all the big banks are, Credit Suisse, UBS, they're all there. Trustco is also there and digital asset <laughs> community is also there. So I'm very proud of that. The last time I've been there was late 96, early 97, but it's a pretty traditional place. So overall, it might not have changed that much, but putting a startup center right in the middle of it truly is a very uh, shaking things up a bit, probably. Yes. Let's say it, you have a lot of people in blue suits walking around, but also a few of these startup cool people. So it's, it's a nice mix at the moment. Yeah. T-shirts and hoodies and so on. So exactly. any final comments you might have? Thank you very much for inviting me. Really, it's a pleasure that I managed to share a bit my thoughts about the future of the digital asset world, which is very, very bright. You know, I wish everyone to enjoy the next bull run and to benefit from it for actually everyone. Everyone actually in the end has to benefit from what we do. 
Trolltech's motto is stay liquid. So I wish everyone to stay liquid and uh, till next time. Wonderful. Stay liquid. Thank you, Anton. Thank you. Bye-bye.